Hi, this is Dr. Centeno, and this is the presentation that I recently gave to the NFL Physician Society scientific session at the NFL Combine on February 26, 2016. And I'm going to give it here just so that everyone can have a sense of the content that I presented. So the title is Stem Cells, the Top 10 Things to Know. So who the heck am I? Uh, began using stem cells to treat orthopedic conditions in 2005, so I was the first physician in the U.S. to do that. And I've published 16 peer-reviewed publications on the use of MSCs to treat orthopedic conditions. We have a university-style stem cell research lab as part of our Colorado practice. You can see some of the photos of that on the right. Uh, so we're a bit unique when it comes to uh, stem cell research. And we're tracking more than 4,000 stem cell treated patients in a nonprofit registry at this point, all the way back to 2005. So what are stem cells? Well, they're really just blank slate cells that can turn into another cell type. Having said that, there's an awful lot of information about how they do their work, uh, which is through paracrine actions, exosomes, mitochondrial transfer, and many other proposed and observed mechanisms. And the main types are adult embryonic induced pluripotent, induced pluripotent cells are artificially created stem cells. And they're really the repairmen of the body. If you didn't have stem cells around in pretty much every tissue, you'd really soon perish. And the two main players we're going to really focus on here are mesenchymal stem cells and, and hematopoietic stem cells. Why? Because both of those stem cell types turn out to be important for orthopedic injuries. So where can you get stem cells? Pretty much any tissue, really. Uh, bone marrow, adipose, synovial tissue, uh, pretty much every tissue in the body has a stem cell content. And the two main types of tissues that are being used for orthopedic purposes today are bone marrow and adipose. Right now, we have much, much more research on bone marrow for orthopedic use than adipose. It's about 100 to 1. Now, certainly that could change in the future, but that's where we are right now. And it's a bit of an urban myth that adipose has a lot more stem cells than bone marrow. This is largely based on a math error, i.e. MSCs are reported as a percentage of nucleated cells in both tissues, and there's a heck of a lot more nucleated cells in bone marrow, so you can't compare these two things as a percentage. In addition, uh, bone marrow has many, many more hematopoietic stem cells than adipose, uh, which also throws that equation off quite a bit. So what's in bone marrow, mesenchymal stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, platelets, osteochondral reticular cells, mu cells, macrophages, parasites, and endothelial progenitor cells? If we know where you can get viable stem cells, where you can't get viable stem cells is from amniotic fluid. Uh, this is an interesting story. We, uh, a few years ago, were approached by a lot of different sales reps who told us that uh, these amniotic fluid vials were quite rich in stem cells. And we were pretty excited about that uh, because who knows, maybe through some sort of regulatory loophole, we could get a hold of a lot of uh, these fetal stem cells. However, it turns out it was pretty much all a scam. Meaning at the end of the day, the amniotic fluid products being sold under an FDA 361 tissue registration contained no viable stem cells. Uh, we tested this extensively in our lab. Sales reps will often tell physicians that they have MSCs, so be very, very careful because this, this really does meet the definition of a scam here. Uh, they don't have any cells, and yet sales reps are claiming they have cells. The doctors are buying them and then claiming to patients that they have cells. And again, their FDA registrations say they have no cells. Uh, we did the initial testing, then turned it over to a nonprofit to complete the testing. And no stem cells have been found in any vial of amniotic fluid product that's on the market. Um, 
And in general, the IOF also showed that they didn't help uh, older mesenchymal stem cells like we had hoped, at least in vitro. And they do contain growth factors, cytokines, extracellular matrix. Probably their effects are weaker than PRP. So this is sort of an extraordinarily expensive PRP shot. And who knows, they may have other benefits, but there's really not much data at this point. So what are different types of stem cell procedures? They really fall into two different categories. You have the first, which are same day bone marrow concentrate. The Buffy coat is isolated via centrifugation. There are many different kits and machines. Samples can also be processed in the lab. So that's a same day procedure. Then you have a culture expanded procedure, not allowed in the US because it's considered a drug if I take your cells and culture expand them to get more. And there are sites in Cayman, Mexico, Europe, Asia that do this kind of stuff. Um, and basically what happens is that those Buffy coat cells are plated in monolayer culture and grown in an incubator, and they're slowly expanded to get more and more. Um, now, what's interesting is there's much more orthopedic basic science research on culture than same-day procedures. So, interesting that same-day procedures are more common, but we have more research on cultured procedures. So, are these procedures safe? There are three big studies you should know about. Uh, the first is our study of 339 patients that was in culture expanded bone marrow stem cells. Uh, they were safe. And uh, that was published way back in 2011. The second big paper is Felipe Hernigau's paper on uh, patients that were treated with bone marrow concentrate. Now, this wasn't all complications like our paper was. It was actually just focusing on cancer and tumor, uh, but there was no evidence of cancer uh, in 1,800 patients followed for uh, a long period of time. And then our 2365 same day BMC and culture expanded MSC paper just got accepted for publication. So this is both same day stem cell procedures and culture procedures followed for up to nine years. So quite a bit of safety data. Now, you often hear physicians say that there really isn't enough information or data or there's very little data on the use of stem cells for orthopedic injuries. And that's not necessarily true. While it's true we need many more randomized controlled trials, what's not true is we don't have a lot of data. So what's interesting is that last summer in August, I went through and I created this graph and you can see it here. Each one of these little circles represents a study. There's a little uh, icon on there for a scalpel or a syringe. And that would say whether it's a surgical study or an injection study or both. And if you add up the N or the number of patients treated in each of those studies and who have had their results reported in the peer-reviewed literature, you get 5,513. So quite a bit of publishing activity on the use of orthopedic bone marrow stem cells. Now, now this is, does not apply to fat. There'd be dramatically less for fat. But just for bone marrow, it goes back all the way to 1997. And uh, you can see here, these are our papers amidst all the different papers as of last summer. Uh, I'm highlighting those now so you can get a sense of what we've published amidst all the different papers that are out there. So one of the interesting things about the player report from this year in the NFL and the injury report is that rotator cuff tears are on the rise and stem cells may be able to help rotator cuff tear healing. Uh, there was a nice paper again by Felipe Hernigal in 2014 where he took 45 patients who had uh, bone marrow concentrate injections after their rotator cuff surgeries and 45 who did not. These were matched controls. And the retear rate was halved in the folks that got bone marrow concentrate injections in addition to their surgery. Now, our early randomized controlled trial data on our proprietary bone marrow concentrate ultrasound guide injection for partial thickness and full thickness, non-retracted rotator cuff tears. I'm going to show you some of that data. This is non-surgical. And the data looks as you would expect it to look if this was working, that in the uh, treatment group, you're seeing uh, improved function, you're seeing improved pain, 
and in the control group, uh, just the opposite. So are stem cells helpful for knee osteoarthritis? And what's really interesting is that there are a lot of guys, as you know, in the NFL that play with chondral lesions. They play with partial thickness, cartilage loss here and there, and they kind of nurse these things along. So this is really the group I'm talking about. And if you look at all the different studies, uh, you'll see the patient N listed there, and I've created this table. There are three small randomized controlled trials, and then there's our very large prospective case series of 840 patients. Uh, so we've got the biggest study in this area, there are, but it's not a randomized controlled trial. There are three randomized controlled trials. And there are two studies here that are someone else's cells or allogeneic. There are three studies here that are autologous, including ours. And the bottom line is that they all show some reasonable efficacy. So some reasonable data is being amassed showing that uh, bone marrow stem cells likely help knee osteoarthritis. Well, fractures in the NFL are also a big deal. So can stem cells help speed fracture healing? Uh, and I don't know that for sure, but I, there is an interesting paper that was published uh, in 2011 at the annual meeting of the Academy, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And what was interesting about it is it's a small prospective randomized controlled trial. It was delayed union distal tibia fractures injected with same day bone marrow concentrate. And the mean time to achieve union was 71 days in the 12 patients that got stem cell injections uh, directly into the fracture line. This is not IV. Uh, and 112 days in a control group of 12 patients receiving usual care. So not sure that this says that acute fractures can be healed quicker with stem cell injections, but it's certainly promising. We've also published a uh, paper, a small, smaller case series on the use of culture expanded stem cells and fracture healing. So number 10, where is all of this headed? Where is this going? Well, bottom line is I think We've already seen the use of stem cells explode over the last five years in sports medicine. It's increasing year over year. That's going to continue. By 2020, this will all be pretty commonplace. Uh, there'll be some home run injection applications that uh, precise injections will start to replace some surgeries. We'll also see quite a bit of surgery plus stem cells. We'll see several culture expanded mesenchymal stem cell products on the market, but uh, insurance coverage is likely to be pretty spotty given their high cost. And we'll see other orthobiologics like platelet rich plasma start to get insurance coverage for a few applications, most notably tendonitis uh, uh, or lateral epicondylitis and or knee osteoarthritis. So I was asked by Jim Bradley to come up with a list of which athletes should and shouldn't get stem cells. Now, this is more just a general list. This is uh, focused on our clinical registry experience and some of the data that you've seen. And this may or may not apply to the average patient. I was, I'm focusing this specifically on NFL athletes and, and where's the sweet spot, as, as he wanted me to uh, tell you. So the sweet spot would be for at least for injections of stem cells, partial thickness, rotator cuff tear and ligament tears, possibly complete non-retracted tears, early to moderate uh, osteoarthritis for symptom relief. And I, and I say that, I mean, this works equally as well, it seems like in knee severe osteoarthritis, but, but we don't see many knee severe osteoarthritis patients in the NFL. Um, and tendinopathy that won't respond to PRP, um, are a, is another good area. Perfect candidates for surgery plus injection. Again, these are patients that are probably going to get surgery anyway. Uh, microfracture, there's some promising uh, early data on microfracture and some nice animal data showing that if you add stem cells, you get better cartilage. Uh, partial meniscectomy, that Vagness study was in a partial meniscectomy model that I showed you before. Rotator cuff repair, obviously that's the injection uh, paper I showed you by Felipe Hernigal. And uh, fracture, 
ORF, possibly based on the one study I showed you, some of our data and some of Felipe Hernigau's data. So who are poor candidates? Moderate to more severe hip OA. Again, not something that you're likely to see too much in NFL players, but if you did, that's something that's going to respond less often. And degenerative disc disease with loss of disc height, that is something you do see in the NFL players as they get older. Um, that's very unlikely to respond based on our 11-year uh, clinical experience. So I'll end this here um, and take some questions. And uh, if you're watching online, uh, thank you so much for watching this. Have a wonderful day and week. And uh, hopefully you've learned a little something about stem cells.